Um, thank you very much, Chair President. Uh, I'm really regretful that I should have taken Italian class when I was in school. But I'll do my best uh, addressing my talk in English. <laughs> and thank you very much, everyone, for staying uh, with me in the time for the last talk in this session. Um, this talk is also, again, talking about connectivity in autism. Um, what is different from the previous talks is that it's about the functional connectivity of autism uh, rather than structural connectivity um, uh, addressed by previous speakers. Um, this talk um, is about the complex network properties of intrinsic brain functional organization in autism spectrum conditions. So the first question, the first research question is, why do we apply network analysis? The main reason is that there is a prevailing theory of aberrant connectivity in autism that has been mentioned repeatedly by previous speakers. Um, it's mainly addressed by task function MRI studies that um, people found under connectivity in task related conditions using task evoked function MRI studies. Also, in resting state function MRI studies, people noticed um, disconnectivity or reduced connectivity within the default network using seed based approach. Also, in EEG or MEG study, people found reduced um, synchronization. All of these are some kind of evidence supporting there are problems with connectivity, but what kind of problem is it? There are also some theories about um, increased local connectivity which results in decreased global connectivity. The second theoretical um, inspiration for our study is that we have already known that um, the brain is actually organized in a small world network. So we can apply network analysis based on small world um, network properties uh, to, to look at the intrinsic functional organization or structural organization of the brain. Um, Given the heterogeneity of subject with autism, we have to be aware that this study is per performed on adults with autism, and they're all high-functioning adults with average intelligence. So this might be different from um, the, the studies of previous speakers, it's mainly on low-functioning um, adults or children with autism. Uh, we have um, 30 autism spectrum condition um, participants who were diagnosed with Asperger syndrome or high functional autism and 33 neurotypical controls. Um, their diagnoses were all conf confirmed again by ADAR. Um, they are matched by their age and all the scales of IQ. We took um, resting state function MRI uh, with a very long, actually very long scanning session, it's about 14 minutes, and we took 620 um, time points in order to tackle the very low frequency um, oscillations of the brain. All the participants were instructed to be having her, uh, their eyes closed, but not to fall into a sleep. And the participants are all male. Um, then the data are pre-processed in this way. We took the whole brain data. This is a, a whole brain exploratory approach. It's not a region of interest approach. So we parceled all the brain into 118 regions. Then we trim off eight regions that showed poor signal qualities, leaving 110 regions in the brain. Um, then these um, time series were, were um, transformed by discrete wavelet transformation and giving different uh, scale-specific correlation coefficients, a correlation coefficient matrix that helping us to understand the functional connectivity of the whole brain. And we're particularly looking at the lowest scales, lowest scales that we are confident enough to achieve, which is between 0.024 and 0.048 hertz. So here are the results. The first results we're looking at, uh, in general, what are the connectivity differences, or are there connectivity differences in a global or lower level? Um, first, we look at different wavelet, uh, wavelet scales. These are actually different bands, frequency bands. Um, so as you can see, no matter what frequency band, there are actually no detectable global connectivity differences. Uh, we particularly looked at the very low frequency bands here, which is what I just mentioned, 0.024 to 0.048. Uh, again, you cannot see any differences, um, global differences, global mean differences, or even differences uh, with, between left hemispheres 
between groups or right hemisphere between groups. So these are the correlation matrix. These are the neurotypical matrix and these are the autism matrix. And these are all the left hemisphere regions and right hemisphere regions. However, there are some regions that seemingly showing uh, a bit lower connectivity, which is the frontal and temporal ones. So if you look at the left hemisphere first, we can see that um, these are the p-values, but they are one-tailed uh, one uh, one p-values. And this is because we have a, a prior theory saying that uh, people with autism have lower com functional connectivity. So we assume that they, they have lower functional connectivity compared to the neurotypical people. So we found that, uh, in general, the mean connectivity within frontal lobes and uh, temporal lobes in the left hemisphere seems to be a bit lower in people with autism. Also, the connectivity between frontal and temporal and connectivity between temporal and parietal seems to be marginally lower. And for the right hemisphere, we show the same thing. Frontal, temporal, lower, and between frontal, temporal, lower, and also for right temporal to left frontal, left parietal, and left temporal, there seems to be lower connectivity. These are all the p-values. However, as you can see, these are all one tail p, and they are just marginal. So we, we can say, well, there are really no uh, significantly detectable connectivity differences, but there might be some trends. But how about the, the, um, this, the local level? Maybe the, the, the differences uh, are not happening in the global level or even lower level, but in a global level. So we looked at the uh, 110 nodes, regions, um, respectively, uh, under a, 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 net, a network perspective. So these are the nodal level results. So if we compare node by node, we use node-based analysis, then we found that in the orbital frontal cortex, as mentioned by previous speaker, uh, it shows significantly lower connectivity to the rest of the brain in the people with autism. And also this condition happens in right anterior middle temporal gyrus. And here we use two-tailed P because um, we have no prior hypothesis on which nodes showing higher or lower connectivity in people with autism. The most significant result actually is using an edge-based analysis. So using the technical, uh, technique called network-based statistics, we are able to identify a cluster of edges. Edge, an edge means a connection between two nodes. So a cluster of edges that show significantly lower functional connectivity in the group of autism compared to neurotypical. Um, most interestingly, these identified hypoconnected networks are all uh, centered on bilateral orbital frontal cortex. So it actually echoes the previous nodal results. And more significantly, these, the, mean, um, the mean connectivity within this network is negatively correlated to the childhood symptoms measured by uh, ADIR, um, the social subscale. Um, so that means the, for people with autism, the lower connectivity within this hyperconnecting network, the higher childhood autism, the more severe childhood autism symptoms measured by ADR social subscale. So here are the first uh, interim summary. We cannot really confidently say there are global connectivity differences in functional connectivity networks between the two groups, but possibly there, will be, there are hyperconnectivity in frontal and temporal lobes, especially right temporal. Most significantly, there are hypoconnectivity in bilateral orbital frontal cortex and right anterior medial temporal gyrus, and particularly the connectivity from orbital frontal cortex. And these, these uh, connectivity show a correlation with symptom scores. <laughs>